Hello, and welcome to The Leadership Edge. I'm your host, Ted Gorski. The Leadership Edge is a show that speaks on and talks about leadership issues that are affecting you leaders out there on a daily basis. What we do in this show is talk about those tips, those techniques, and those topics, and we give you kind of some ideas on how you to deal with those so that you too can be an effective leader on a day-to-day -day basis. So today, it's an interesting show. I've, I've kind of saw some viewers all over in the street and they say, hey, Ted, it's been a while since you've had your potluck show. So guess what we're doing today, producer Chris? Potluck! Yes. And how potluck works is I have a series of questions that are totally unrelated. And the whole concept here is we'll talk about the question, give you some tips and techniques, in regards of answering the question. And these questions are pretty much what have, I've encountered in my coaching sessions, let's say over the last month, month and a half. So I figured if I'm coaching leaders and these things are popping up, I figured let's share it to the viewers of the show and to producer Chris, and let's see what happens. So let us roll to question number one. What is the biggest problem you see in leaders today? You know, it's kind of interesting. I've encountered, ooh, that's a nice graphic there, producer Chris. I love it. Try new stuff. I love it. I've popped into leaders a lot. We've been coaching into some sessions. And one thing I've noticed that problems that leaders are impacting today is they're getting too judgmental. What's happening is that they're making prejudgments on people on their team, or they're making prejudgments on issues that are happening on their team. I had a recent leader that I was coaching that couldn't understand why one of their new hires wasn't producing at a certain level. They were concerned about why they don't seem to be picking things up. So I asked them the question, you know, what possibly could be causing this? And as we were kind of going through and drilling down, the one thing I heard quite a bit from this leader is, I don't understand it. You know, when I started in this kind of role, you know, I was able to do this and do this and do this. And I was able to pick this up, and I don't understand why this person can't. And what struck me in our coaching session after, after about a few minutes is that they were really looking at themselves in a subjective way. They were measuring themselves with the person in their performance. So they figured they were able to pick it up quickly. They couldn't understand why the other person couldn't. So I asked them to take themselves out of the situation and look at it from a 25,000 foot level. So I say to you as leaders out there, are you being somewhat subjective when you're looking at things? Are you kind of really measuring yourself against others and saying, I do it this way, I don't understand why they can't? More importantly, though, what's, what you need to do is you have to be more objective when you're viewing things. When you're viewing performance, or if you're viewing performance that's not happening, try to understand why that's happening and not to be subjective in looking at it from your perspective and how you do it. Very, very, very important step. So, jumping now to question two. What's one thing a leader can do today to be more effective? You know, what's been interesting is, I love that graphic, producer Chris. You're welcome. Is that, you know, one thing that leaders can do to be more effective is, is to be curious. You know, in my coaching sessions, what's been interesting is, is when I'm working with leaders, they seem to be stuck on not really, they're looking at things in a face value perspective. They're not curious to find out why potential things are happening. I always ask the question, what's missing? And leaders tend to not, they get lazy is pretty much what I'm getting at. What I'm not, what, what's real important to be more effective is you can't have lazy thinking. You gotta be able to look outside the box to try to find out why something is not happening. So my biggest, I guess, tip here is for you to really look at it, be curious, don't get lazy. Follow up. Look for information. A second part, I'll say this too, is be better listeners. One of the things I've noticed with some of the great leaders I coach is they're fabulous listeners. 
They're able to pick things up and able to kind of deal with stuff. You get my drift, producer Chris? I get what you're throwing out there. See, this is why with producer Bill, producer Bill would have not answered it that way. That's why you're moving up the scale in producership. I'm telling you that. Just a few good shows and you can see what happened. So let's jump to question three. Can you provide a tip for new leaders? Absolutely. One of the things I've always talked about my new leaders is that your goal is to build relationships. Your goal is to go out and build relationships in the organization because you're going to need to cash them in when you need them. One of the things I notice with new leaders is that they fail to do that. Well, they're so hung up on, where's the hand? Where's the hand? Ah, oh, there you go. Very good, Producer Chris. All right, building relationships, it's key. I think one of the reasons I, in my earlier in my career, I grew in organizations and moved up very quickly is I had the ability to reach out to different parts of the organization and build relationships. You see, as new leaders, you're in the people business. And part of people business is building relationships. The most successful leaders I coach have that innate ability to build relationships throughout the organization because you never know when you have to cash those chips in. So new leaders out there, build relationships in your team and outside the team because there'll be many times where you're going to need to leverage those to get things done. So question four, how do I improve my problem solving skills? You know, one of the things I've noticed with coaches um, or the leaders I work with when I'm coaching them is problem solving is a vital skill for any leader to have. And especially with some leaders, they're not necessarily verifying information. And, and what's interesting is I had a recent coaching session when I asked a certain new manager about some information they got. And when I asked them, like, where did they get it? How did they verify it? <laughs> they kind of told me they talked to Mel in the mail room. Now, you know, Mel in the mail room is great, but it's not necessarily where I think the plethora of information is. But they're or, a really nice person. They are very nice, Chris. They absolutely are. And we love all the people in the mail room. But more importantly, though, as a leader, you need to really verify your data. Because bad data means bad decisions, right? So the key thing here is you need to verify. So as a leader to improve your, your problem solving skills, what I say, verify your data and get information. Verify it, gather it, gather more information because great information and good information means better decisions. So we don't want to discount Mel in the mail room, but we have to verify it at all levels. Hey, like, where's my check? There you go, there you go. And as one wise past president said, trust but verify. That's your role as a leader. Question five. I see myself as a realist, but others see me as negative. Any tips on developing a more positive approach? I wrote this one down because I've encountered several leaders who have told me this. And what's kind of interesting is they really have an approach where when issues are coming to them, they can easily see what's not working versus what can work. It's kind of like producer Bill, my old producer. It's not like you, Chris. No, nope, I actually will make things work. You do. So as a leader, it's important that you kind of look at why something will work versus why something can't. Because what you're training the people who directly report to you do is that if they start to realize that you're going to continually poke holes and not giving them any positive feedback, they're going to reach a point and say, I know what this person's going to say, so there's no reason for me to bring up this potential option or solution. Been there. Been there. Done that. And the key thing here is that as a leader, you want to bring in, here's that word again, plethora of options so you can make better decisions. So I challenge you today starting after you watch this show, that any time you're dealing with situations, look on why something will work before you poke holes in it. Question six, this is for you, Producer Chris. How can you claim the number one producer spot for the show? Oh, this is easy. By working hard. And? 
listening to you. Oh, this is why you're moving up, my friend. And those fabulous graphics. Upgrading the show. That's what we're looking for. Pro Always an upgrade. Proactive upgrading is what we're looking for, my friend. Always. So, a great addition to the, to the Leadership Edge team, Chris. Let me tell you that. Thank you, sir. Next question. Question seven. How can I better empower people? Well, the key thing about empowering is your ability, you know, part of empowering means delegating down. But empowering also means when you empower individuals to share responsibility, but more importantly, share the rewards. Being able to feel comfortable enough to do that. Effective leaders have that knack of empowering people effectively. And when they do that, great things will occur. But you as a leader have to know what, when to let go. And if you do that, it's going to be a very positive effect of the person you're empowering. Your time management will be positively impacted, too, because you're delegating stuff down. But here's the key tip, and it's an interesting uh, point I'm going to make here, because this has happened to a leader that I've recently coached last week, is they were struggling with empowerment. And what they were doing was still kind of like micromanaging in kind of an indirect way, uh, not heavy micromanaging, but still kind of there. And what they forgot to realize is that their innate ability was to solve problems. So when they heard something, they would try to solve it. I challenged this leader to be more of a coach. That I didn't want them to share the necessary solution, but I wanted them to coach the person, the other leader they were working with and trying to develop, to find the solution or find the answer. So to better imbue your empowerment, don't provide the answer. Let the person that you're developing find it for themselves. You'll see when you do that, you're going to get better results in terms of your empowering. So I challenge you to do that for your leaders. Question eight, being trustworthy and being influential. What is the connection? Now I bring this up because this actually happened in two of my coaching sessions in the last week. Trustworthiness means your people trust you not only to come to you with important information, they know that, they'll keep thing, that you'll keep things private, but trustworthiness also means keeping your word, meaning if you say you're going to do something by a certain date, you're going to get it done. So it doesn't just mean keeping secrets, it means honoring your commitment. Well, it's important to be able to keep your secrets, but also it's important to get things done when you say you're going to get things done. That is going to help you become more influential. Because if you don't keep your word and get things done, it's going to impact you in a negative way. So there is a direct correlation here, but it's important for you as a leader to look at trustworthiness more than keeping secrets. It's about keeping your word and getting tasks done. And if you're struggling with keeping your word and getting tasks done, you need to look at it. You need to look at your time management skills and look at your empowerment like we talked about last in our last question. Are you empowering people effectively to do what they need to do? Question nine. What is the importance of, for leaders of leaders to slow the game down? Unique concept. What's interesting is you're working in an environment in the office. It's dynamic. It's running around. Just like here, producer Chris. That's right. A lot of things going on. All the time. All the time. But as leaders, it's important for you to be able to slow the whole process down. It reminds me of uh, two great basketball players once they were interviewed. You may have heard them, Larry Bird. I uh, heard that guy. Yeah. And they asked a question. One of the reporters asked him a question about how does he see the court when he's out there? Why does he kind of see people open where other people couldn't? And he said a very interesting answer. He says, when I'm in the game, the game slows down for me. Meaning, despite all the chaos that was on the court, with all those players kind of running around, Larry Bird had the ability to be able to slow things down so he could see when people are open at certain points, which then allowed his pinpoint passing to occur. 
What's interesting is Magic Johnson also he said the same thing when they asked when a reporter asked him that question. Two great athletes, two great basketball performers and players, call, talk about slowing the game down. Same thing for leaders. If you're living in a dynamic environment, there's a lot of things going on. Your job as a leader is to kind of slow things down so you can see other solutions, see other opportunities, and maybe see some other problem-solving issues that you may not have seen before. So the key thing is take a breath, slow down. I talked to two leaders about this, especially they're running at a very high, very, very fast pace about the whole concept of slowing down. That when you're, when you're kind of in that moment, be in the moment and not be swept up by it. So slow the game down. It's going to help you make better decisions. Question 10. Producer Chris, I need your input. Who played a better James Bond? Was it Sean Connery or Roger Moore? The James Bond. Oh, that's a very good. That's, I would sound as like that was uh, Sean Connery? That is Sean Connery. Yes, I would agree. Roger Moore was too, um, what should we say, mm, just wasn't hardcore enough. Yeah, good. Yeah, that's a good word for it. I, I was right. What's funny is when I first see, I saw the James Bond movies, I really was leaning to Roger Moore because he was more suave. Sure. Maybe that was it. But Connery grew on me, and I really think Sean Connery was a better Bond. So I would agree with you there. Connery tended to be a little more on the uh, intelligent side of things. Yes, and more rugged, which is kind of real important. So, next question. What are personal triggers? Mm. This one is something that's really vital for leaders. Triggers are those things that get you out of balance, meaning that it's an emotion maybe. Maybe it's anger that will get you out of your balance and kind of move you out of balance. Now, when you're out of balance, if you make decisions on an emotional level like this, your decisions are probably not going to be the most effective. The whole idea of personal triggers is to identify those things that are going to cause you to bounce up or down in terms of your emotions. And being able to, if you notice what they are, to get you back into balance so you don't let these triggers of emotion get a hold of you and sweep you away. Personal triggers can be many things. It can be a look. Maybe how someone looks at you. Could be maybe a certain phrase that maybe triggers you. Or maybe it's a certain word. For me, when my mom was alive, when she would say Theodore, immediately triggered me into, oh boy, I did something wrong. So the key thing here is also think of the tone on someone, the tone of voice they would use that could cause you to get emotional. Now the key thing here is the more you can identify, the less power they have over you. Because you don't want something in a meeting for someone to hit a personal trigger of yours and get you out of balance in front of the president or vice president. So personal triggers are key. And every time I'm working with leaders, we're always identifying them so we can minimize its impact. So here's what I challenge you to do. Think of a recent situation you've encountered where maybe you got out of balance for some reason. Maybe anger took you over. Maybe frustration. And what I want you to do is analyze that situation and write down what was that thing or things that kind of got you out of balance. Think of something that someone said. Maybe a look. Maybe a certain tone. But look at that and build that list. And as you develop that list, the key thing here is that it will lose its power over you. Could you include writing on that, like uh, Facebook wall writing? Could. That could. It could be even an email, right, Certain how someone writes something. Great point, Chris. That's why you're moving up the producer scale. Yeah. Okay, question 12. Why do leaders need, need to know about learning styles? <clears throat> You know, this is uh, something that comes up a lot in my coaching sessions. As a leader, it's important to understand, number one, how do you learn? And there's three different ways that people learn. First is the auditory, which means it's through the, the word itself. It's just through verbal, you know, verbal exchange. So that's one way. Second is visual. 
you know, people need to see things, maybe on a whiteboard or on a computer screen. And thirdly, it's kinesthetic. They're the doers. They have to physically do it for them to really understand. So the first thing is, as a leader, you need to understand what is your preferred learning style. But more importantly, once you know that, most likely the way that you like to learn is how you like to pass out information or how you delegate things or provide information to people on your team. Well, when you're doing that, are the people on their team able to grasp that information? Are you matching up their learning styles with the way that you like to learn? Now, if there's a mismatch, what could possibly happen is that you have someone on your team that's constantly coming back asking you the same question over and over again. What that should tell you is that your styles are different. So the key thing is you need to really look at what is your preferred style, but it's also important for you to look at your team and say to you, look at your team and say, okay, what styles do I have on my team? And what do I need to do when I am delegating or giving them some type of instructions to do a project? If it's not your preferred style, you need to adjust your style so they'll consume the information in an effective way. It's real important that you do this because it will reduce frustration for you and for people on your team. That's why learning styles are vital. Question 13, Chris, this one ponders, ponders me. Why do we park in a driveway and drive on a parkway? That has been vexing me for years. Ugh. You know, I still don't know why, but I thought, I figured I'd throw it out and, uh, and, and try to just ponder an answer. But it always, always confused me. But needless to say, we'll, we'll continue on. Question 14. Why are energy levels important for leaders? Well, energy levels are important because energy in terms helps you make better decisions. Energy helps you to be more patient. Energy helps you to be a better listener. We all have an energy cycle. We all have energy levels, just like levels in your gas tank. When your energy is full, you're a better listener. You're a better decision maker. You have more patience. What? Yeah. Well, see, your energy's low there, producer Chris. I need more coffee. There you go. Coffee always helps. But if your energy's really low in your past E, decision-making is poor, listening is poor, and you don't have any patience. Now, how does that affect you as a leader? You can tell. It's going to make you very ineffective. So the key thing is you have to manage your energy levels which means it's putting activities in your calendar that provide you energy and enjoyment to continually replenish your gas tank or your energy gas tank. I do this exercise with all leaders I work with because I would say 99.9% .9 of the leaders don't take care of themselves. And what we're talking about here is you taking care of yourself so you can be a better leader. And lastly, our last question. Well, it's more of a thought. There are three types of people in this world. People who watch things happen, people who make things happen, and people, the third type, people don't know what the hell just happened. Okay, what we're talking about here in the Leadership Edge is making things happen. We want you to be part of that group because those leaders are very proactive and get things done. So you will see these three types on your team. The key thing is we're, you want to build that proactiveness and you want to be the person who makes things happen. So there you go. There's uh, 15 of our potluck questions today to get you leaders thinking about those things that can make you better leaders. So in wrapping up today's show, if there's anything we can do to help you with your leadership needs, please feel free to reach, reach out to us at www.getyouredge.com and we'll be more than happy to talk to you to see what we can do to help you with your leadership needs. So again, I'm Ted Gorski, host of the show. Thanks for tuning in to today's Leadership Edge. See you next time on the Leadership Edge.